Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us for our first webinar, a part of our Patient Ambassador Program. My name is Lauren Foreman. I'm the Executive Director of the Chris Kluge Foundation, and I'll be introducing you to today's moderator and panelists. I first want to thank our sponsors, Novartis and Children's Hospital Colorado. If you're new to GoWebinar, you'll notice that there's a box to field questions to the panelists on your console. We're going to have a brief Q&A at the end of the presentation, so we encourage you to type your questions into the chat as they come to mind. You'll notice that there's a button to raise your hand. Please only use this if we, you want to ask your question over the microphone rather than typing in the message. If we see a hand raised, that'll be our signal to unmute your microphone when we get to your question. We'll also be doing a comprehensive follow-up, so sending your questions in will help us answer any that we don't have any time to get to. Now I'd like to introduce our panelists. Mazzy Noriga, a 19-year-old liver transplant recipient from San Diego, California. Mazzy received her new liver in 2003 as a result of autoimmune hepatitis, although she wasn't diagnosed until after her transplant. Her transplant has allowed her to do so many things she otherwise might not have been able to do throughout her life. Jean Shields. Jean lives in New York with her daughter, Lauren, who is both heart and kidney transplant recipient. Lauren's also the namesake of Lauren's Law, a statewide law that requires the question of organ donation registration to be mandatory when you answer, when answering and obtaining a driver's license in New York, which is Lauren was instrumental in passing. During her daughter's medical journey, Jean was first caregiver, then patient and donor when she became her daughter's living donor just this past July 21st. Melissa McQueen. Melissa is a transplant mother, caregiver, and executive director of Transplant Families. It's an organization which works with patients and caregivers of children who are listed for or have already received a life-saving transplant, and it helps to guide them to support, education, and assistance. Dr. Margaret Bach. Dr. Bach is a pediatric nephrologist specializing in transplant and is the kidney transplant medical director at Children's Hospital Colorado and an assistant professor of pediatrics at University of Colorado School of Medicine. She found herself in this career path because of her love of science and what the kidneys do and taking care of children from the very beginning and supporting them through the whole process of combating issues and then sending them off into the adult world hopefully in a much better place than when she met them. And last but not least, our moderator for this webinar, liver transplant recipient, Olympian, and founder of the Chris Klug Foundation, Chris Klug. Thank you, Lauren. Hope uh, everyone's doing well today. Thanks a lot for joining us. I want to uh, say thanks to our friends at Children's Hospital uh, for helping make this possible today. Uh, that film, I don't know about uh, any of you, but that brought tears to my eyes and certainly resonated with uh, my transplant experience and, and that of my families. And I thought it was so well um, said by uh, by both parents that, you know, when you do get that call, there, there's such a mix of emotions. And I certainly experienced that. What I'd like to do for a few minutes is uh, share my story just for a few minutes and uh, my transplant experience, and then uh, pass it on to uh, our panelists. I've got some questions for all of our panelists. I wanna say thanks to our panelists for joining us today. I know uh, all of you are very busy and uh, are living your lives, and thanks for taking an hour or so out of your day today and, and spending it with us at Chris Kluge Foundation um, and giving back to help the transplant community. I feel very privileged to be a part of this transplant community. And uh, I think all recipients and, and those that have received the gift of life uh, feel a certain responsibility to, to give back and help other people that are going through the same thing that all of us did. Uh, I received a life-saving liver transplant uh, 20 years ago on July 28th. So uh, it was a pretty special summer for me to celebrate uh, 20 years since my life-saving liver transplant. I'm uh, happy to still be here and healthier and stronger than ever. And, and really, there's nothing I can't do today. Uh, I actually raced my bike last night in the Aspen Cycling Club Series. It was our final race of the season and uh, fortunately kept it rubber side down and had a fun bike race. But uh, selfishly, I love to bike. I love to mountaineer. I love still riding my 
uh, pretty much any board sport, snowboard, surfboard, foil board. I love doing all those things selfishly because they interest me and I'm passionate about board sports and, and as I said, other activities. But it's also a great opportunity to show the world what's possible uh, after uh, a life-saving organ transplant. And so it's really fun to uh, let people know that I had a, a liver transplant. And, you know, I think when, when you tell somebody that, they say, gosh, I'm, I'm sorry. And I say, don't be sorry. It was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. And uh, if I had the choice to do it all over again, I would do it exactly the same way. I feel uh, very fortunate to have had uh, a liver transplant and it really shaped me into who I am um, and made me realize, I know it sounds cliche, but what's an important in life? My friends, my family, my second chance at life, my health, and uh, live in this great uh, quality of life and this second chance, this new lease on life, as we all say. Um, I got started in, in board sports you know, a long time ago when I was about nine years old. I fell in love with skateboarding, saw the first snowboards and said, that's skateboarding on snow, I've got to try it. And I did, and I was immediately uh, hooked and addicted to the sport. And that's all I wanted to do was ride my snowboard. And it took me all over the world. It took me to uh, uh, my first Olympic games in 1998 in Nagano, Japan. And that was pretty special being uh, named the first ever uh, US Olympic snowboard athlete in 1998 on uh, Mount Bachelor where I learned how to snowboard in Oregon. And uh, I went to Nagano, Japan, and, and you recognize that that's a different level of competition, that you're not just uh, representing your sport, but you're representing your family, your community, and your country. And I was so proud to walk into my first opening ceremonies and be a part of Team USA. I, uh, I had a good result in Nagano, Japan. I finished in sixth place. And uh, that's a solid finish, but I was uh, really riding well there and, and in position to uh, compete for a medal and came up a little bit short. So that was a little frustrating. But I set a goal in 98 in Nagano, Japan. I said, I'm going to come back in four years. I'm going to get the job done. I'm going to bring home a shiny necklace. And uh, very few people knew that in 1998 uh, on my first Olympic team that I was actually also on a waiting list. Uh, I had been diagnosed through a routine physical in the early 90s with uh, a rare liver disease that some of us are familiar with, PSC. And told when I sat down with my transplant doc and uh, hepatologist, Dr. Uh, Everson at University Hospital, he said, someday this is going to need require a liver transplant. And I remember looking around the room going, well, who's he talking to? He can't be talking to me. I feel like a million bucks and I'm riding my snowboard and doing all these other activities that I love. I said, doc, I'll see you in uh, 20 years and come up with a pill or something I can take and we can stop talking about a liver transplant because that's scary stuff. And uh, he, he said, listen, we're, we're not there yet. And we don't know if it's going to be five or 10 or, or maybe 20 years down the road, but someday you're going to need a transplant. I was very fortunate that uh, University of Colorado transplant team and my family and friends and uh, everybody who worked with me enabled me to continue pursuing my Olympic dreams. But in 2000, my health took a turn for the worse. And after almost six years on a transplant waiting list, about three, three months at a critical stage, a uh, liver transplant became uh, imminent and, and necessary. And uh, I remember getting wheeled into that uh, 7 West at the old University Hospital in Denver uh, just before the anesthesia was taking effect. I remember looking up at my girlfriend, my now wife at the time, and my family and saying, am I going to wake up from this? And uh, I was scared. I wasn't sure I was going to, but I did. Seven hours later and both arms in the air yelling, I rule! I think the uh, painkillers might have been talking a little bit. But uh, I knew right then and there when I woke up, I knew I was going to make it back. I had a, a massive incision from my sternum to my right oblique, looked like a great white, took a bite out of the middle of me. But I knew I was going to make it back. For the first time, I felt whole again. I felt like a new engine had been dropped in me. And I woke up and I said, oh, that's how it's supposed to feel. I had run around my whole life with a compromised engine and uh, not in perfect health. And when I woke up, I realized how sick I truly was. I had sort of a miraculous recovery. I was out of the hospital in four days and riding a stationary bike and lifting weights very lightly about a week later. The uh, prograph that I still take today um, didn't cause any rejection and no infection. And I was back on my snowboard about seven weeks later, uh, won my first World Cup six months after uh, my liver transplant. 
And just a year and a half later, 18 months later, was representing our country in my second Winter Olympic Games in Salt Lake City, where uh, I won a bronze medal and experienced two of the best weeks of my life. And I love sharing my story because, again, it uh, whether it's mountain biking or racing the Leadville 100 or um, mountaineering or, or riding my snowboard, it's so fun to show people that what's possible after a transplant. It doesn't mean that there won't be some bumps in the road and some challenges along the way and, and perhaps some setbacks, but uh, I'm healthier and stronger than I ever was before my transplant. And I love sharing that with people. And, and that's kind of what our foundation is all about is, is helping those touched by, tra by transplantation and uh, helping those that are going through the transplant process. So really honored to uh, be able to give back to the transplant community and uh, through our work with Chris Klug Foundation and the great job that Lauren uh, Pierce, our executive director is doing and CC Cunningham, our program director and all of our volunteers and, and uh, all of our panelists today. So thanks so much for joining us. Um, what I'd like to do now is, is open it up to our panelists and uh, I'm gonna pose a few questions to our panelists. They can share a different perspective on uh, the transplant process. I think today's webinar is focused a little bit more on uh, pediatric with our, our partners at Children's Hospital uh, and Dr. Bach, of course. Um, but I'll open it up right now um, to uh, the doc. Um, if you can join me, I've got a question for you. I'd like to know uh, in this new paradigm that we're living in, uh, living with COVID and uh, this new reality, how has that changed the work that you're doing and, and how has that changed the transplant process uh, in general? I know there are a lot of transplant programs that uh, in fact had to shut down uh, during the sort of early months of uh, COVID and I don't think that was the case with you guys. So love to hear how that's impacted the transplant community and, and your job. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, your story is awesome and fantastic. Um, and I think you embody exactly what we tell folks, you know, like you get a new organ and like, this is the way you should live, like all the exciting things. So thank you for sharing that. It's, you said it in like all the words. Um, um, so thanks for asking about COVID. I think that's a good question. Um, and we've been getting a lot of these questions as I'm sure all transplant programs have. So indeed, I think the entire nation shut down in March is probably the best way of saying it. And yes, um, we also put our program on hold. Um, and I think how transplant programs restarted and picked back up again had a lot to do with um, how much COVID was in the different parts of the United States. So whether you were in New York or in Idaho are two totally different situations. Um, and then also what the sort of, um, you know, protective gear and ventilator and all those sort of situations looked like. Um, and I think, you know, for the first four to eight weeks, everybody was very, very scared. Um, what would COVID mean, especially for people who are immunosuppressed? You know, is this population going to be hit much harder? Like, how can we, you know, willingly give somebody a new organ and immunosuppress them when something like COVID exists. So thankfully time is always there. Um, you know, we've seen, um, and I think, you know, in many parts of the country, people have been, um, especially sort of in the organ transplant world, very particular and very meticulous, at, like watching what happens to people who have organ transplants and putting all the data together, whether it's from Italy, whether it's from New York, or whether it's from Colorado or San Francisco, whatever it might be. So we do get a much better idea as to sort of how people with organ transplants respond to COVID. Um, you know, We've been back up and functioning as per usual with all the social distancing and wearing masks and, you know, um, counseling our patients with all those sorts of things probably since I would say mid to late April, 
Um, and it has been in terms of transplants, because as you know, they're life saving and, you know, you can only hold off for as long as you can hold off business as usual. And we're back sort of doing all the things, getting people to feeling better. Um, I think the biggest things we see in pediatrics are questions about like, well, what happens afterward? Can my kids go to school? Um, you know, what do they need to do in terms of staying away from people? Can they go grocery shopping? Like all those sorts of things. You know, luckily, children are a unique group um, in terms of COVID. Um, and we haven't, um, you know, we haven't seen COVID in and out of the children's hospitals. We just haven't. And when kids have the, the, the virus, it seems to be much calmer. The other thing that we've also been finding um, is that it seems that people who have organ transplants, because you're on some low level of immunosuppression, it doesn't change whether or not you're going to get the virus if you're going to be exposed. But what we do see, it seems that that low level of the prograph or the tacrolimus or the cell step you're taking might sort of like keep your immune system from having that massive inflammatory response that leads to the super scary stuff with COVID where people are intubated and ventilated for weeks to months. So, you know, fingers crossed, like it keeps that way. Um, so, you know, we're lucky um, in, in certain ways. I think in the ways that things have not changed at all for us with COVID is that, you know, we continue to do what we do and we're very strong advocates for you know moving people to the good part of life you know and I think what you said um, earlier was saying oh this is how I'm supposed to feel I, we hear that again and again and again so being able to offer that I think is something that we're so committed to and whatever we need to do in terms of um, keeping people safe in the hospital you know if it's like decreasing the number of computers we can touch or you know space in clinic rooms out um, we need to continue sort of business as usual so that we can get people trans Transplanted and feeling better, and whatever we need to do for it, we do for it. You know, here I am. I was in clinic this morning. Like we wear our little masks and our shields and all that kind of stuff. So, I mean, I think that's just part of who we are right now. Yeah. Well, we're all uh, we're all adapting. I took my six and my nine year old down to the school bus for two days a week uh, in person uh, learning at Aspen Elementary School, and then the other three days a week are online learning, which is a total uh, butt kicker for parents and kids and everybody the online learning but i have to say i was a little apprehensive about putting them on the bus and sending them in person to school um, but it seems to be going well and the kids seem to be uh, staying healthy so far and i pray that that continues but thank you so much for all that you're doing and, and navigating uh, as i said this new paradigm and this uh, covid reality that we're trying to figure out i'm sure it's uh, required some nimbleness on, on the part of you and your teammates. Um, but I, I really uh, commend you for figuring it all out. I think that's what we're all having to be extra resourceful these days and creative and uh, continue on with what it is we're doing despite some additional challenges. So thanks for all you're doing and helping uh, helping people get transplants and, and bounce back and, and live healthy, uh, active lifestyles, which uh, has certainly been my experience. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, I want to uh, ask Jean Shields a question. Uh, Jean, you have uh, really seen, as Lauren uh, um, opened with in the beginning, really all sides of the transplant process as a transplant mom and a recipient with your daughter, Lauren. And uh, you and Lauren received uh, Chris Kluge Foundation's uh, Summit for Life uh, Bounce Back Give Back Award last year. And we got to host you in uh, Aspen, which was such a treat to have you here. We still have to put you on a snowboard, but we'll work <laughs> on that. But uh, not only are you a, a transplant mom, a, a transplant recipient with your daughter, Lauren, and have really changed the landscape for organ donation in, uh, in the state of New York. Um, and I love uh, a mutual friend, uh, our friend Bertin, uh, sent some photos of when I first met uh, you and your daughter, Lauren. And she was a little younger, so you've been uh, doing this since she was, she had her transplant when she was 13, is that right? No, she actually had her transplant right before her ninth birthday. Okay, I'm a little yeah. off on age, sorry, I'm getting older and 
getting my numbers mixed up. But in any case, you guys, what I really wanted to say is, as I've been real champions of the transplant community in this whole process since uh, before she received her transplant, and of course with Lauren's law, as I said, changed the uh, whole transplant, uh, excuse me, the registration and donor designation process in the state of New York, which had abysmal numbers. They're still not uh, uh, on par with Colorado's or some of the leaders in, in the nation as far as donor designation and registration, but you guys have made huge strides and uh, thanks for all you're doing. And to finish that, not only are you a transplant mom and, and Lauren received her transplant, but you recent, recently became a donor when you donated one of your kidneys uh, to Lauren. And I'd love to get your perspective on the different roles, if you will, that, that you've played in, in the transplant process and how has going from recipient to donor changed your perspective and, and, and what does that look like? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's funny. I um, The one thing I can say is that, you know, as a mom, having gone through the experience with Lauren with her heart transplant, you know, there were always those days that I wish that I could do something, you know, I would watch her, I, you know, when she was waiting on the, uh, for her heart, there were times I thought, gosh, I wish, I just wish I could do something. I wish I could give her my heart. I wish I could give her a part of my heart um, to make it better, to make her feel better. <laughs> so, um, you know, to now to have been put in this place where I was finally able to help her, you know, I was finally able to give her something to, you know, make her better was, you know, just such a great feeling. And, um, you know, I wasn't afraid going into that surgery at all. I was really pumped up and, and raring to go because I knew that it, just as I had seen her bounce back so quickly, from her heart transplant, I knew that once she got that kidney in her, she was going to be, she would rebound and be back again, right on her feet. And, um, you know, that's exactly what happened. You know, she, she rebounded so fast. So it was, it was really great. You know, my experience as a donor was, um, you know, it, it just made me feel so good to finally be able to help her in that way. And how was it for Lauren? Uh, going through the transplant process as a heart transplant recipient and now a kidney recipient, how, how did that procedure process recovery compare to the heart? Yeah, it's funny because, um, you know, as you know from her story with her heart, you know, she, she had a, a much harder road with that. You know, she was really um, very sick prior to transplant and she was she was on a bivad machine for her heart and you know she really went through that process and so her recovery from that took much longer um with this with the with the kidney she was just immediately looked better i saw her a couple of days after the surgery she was standing up um and she's really bounced back so quickly she's back in taking classes you know she's in her third year of college now um, you know, right back to it and, uh, you know, studying and doing all the things that she's supposed to. So she's, she's really, really doing well. She's That's ready awesome. for the snowboard, Chris. Oh, I'm sorry? She'll, she's ready for the snowboard, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm getting her back to Aspen. Hopefully it's a big winter ahead and we can all uh, travel again once we get through this COVID stuff. And, and speaking about COVID, Dr. Uh, Margaret Bach just touched on kind of the things that she's doing from the medical side to adjust and, and keep uh, her and her team safe, as well as the patients and, uh, and caregivers. How was it going through the transplant process in the middle of COVID? Did that add a layer of stress and uh, anxiety? And, and at the end, was it better or worse than you expected with not only the the uh, I guess the gravity of, of facing a transplant because I still identified with that family when I had my transplant praise the Lord that the the wait is over but now I'm facing a pretty major surgery so that was enough for me to have a heart attack as well <laughs> but uh, on top of it you're also dealing with COVID what was that like yeah so I mean I think that um you know Lauren had had quite a few 
prior leading up to the transplant, um, starting in like February, she had a number of small visits to the hospital where she was inpatient maybe for a day or two um, while her kidney was starting to fail. And so we were, you know, we went from this place of being home and, and really, um, you know, we were isolated and we weren't, you know, we were keeping away from everyone. I was getting groceries delivered because of, you know, the heart transplant and her immune suppression. Like we were really staying away. So it was really, it was stressful to have to suddenly have to go into a hospital setting. But I have to say that I was so impressed with the way the way they were um you know they had there was such attention to detail in terms of you know uh, cross contamination and there was um you everyone was masked up all the time even when i was in the room with her i was they wanted me with a mask on um you know they were they covid swabbed before any any procedures so in a weird way, like I would tell people, you know, on the out that were out on the outside, they would say, wow, you know, you're in the hospital during COVID. Oh, my gosh. But I think I was safer in the hospital, quite honestly, because there was such high level of, um, you know, attention to making sure that there, you know, everyone was safe and protected. I, the, my, only, my only thing that I felt bad about in terms of COVID with Lauren was that she had so many COVID swab tests done, you know, my... I felt so bad for her, but um, all in all, you know, we knew it was really what was necessary, um, you know, to keep people safe, and that's how we had to look at it. How are things in New York now? Is it is it opening up a little bit and things yeah, loosening yeah, up a little bit? Or is it still, yeah, uh, I mean, it, there you're, you know, things are opening up a little bit, and you are seeing, you know, more people out and about. Um, everyone is still masked up and still practicing social distancing, but. Um, but yeah, it's a, it is a little bit more lax right now than certainly it was back in yeah. um, March, April. <laughs> Good to hear. Well, awesome. You're such a, a great friend to CKF and the transplant community and to me and my family. And uh, we love all that you do for the transplant community. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mazzy, I want to ask, uh, I want to ask you as uh, a transplant recipient who's uh, also immunosuppressed like me, um, with an autoimmune disease, uh, have you taken more precautions um, as a result of COVID? How, how has your life changed um, in this COVID era we're living in? Um, so first, I would say that I was one of the first groups of people to start online school just because that was what was considered safest for me before we really had any information. Um, I wasn't really allowed to leave my house um, until probably about a month ago and it's always with a mask and always carrying hand sanitizer and like a bunch of telehealth appointments rather than in-person appointments even though i love being in person with my doctors they're so amazing but you like a lot of it was just staying inside and not exposing myself to anyone else sure you know i talked to uh valen i had a conversation with valen kiefer who uh is uh, a kidney and liver recipient, more recently liver. And uh, and we talked to Samantha Rose, who you met when we were in San Diego. And they both said, I, they both shared with me that um, as transplant recipients, everybody else is sort of experiencing now what many transplant recipients have known uh, and have been practicing for many years since all of our respective transplants in you know, being careful, washing your hands and uh, just practicing good hygiene and, and cleanliness. And so I think for a lot of transplant recipients, that's sort of par for the course. Would you agree? Definitely. I think I kind of prepared for this my whole life. Um, so it was kind of, it's kind of uh, not as much of a learning curve for transplant patients because we have had exposure to this sort of procedure our whole, like tra post-transplant lives. So. How's school going? It's going really well, actually. I prefer doing school online rather than in person now, I realize. Um, it's just more convenient to manage my health at home than it is to do it at school. But I'm doing really well. I have almost straight A's, I think, and I'm taking some really cool classes this year. <laughs> oh, great. I'm glad you're enjoying it. Is it 
is it easier to do? Are you doing more classes as a result of online or uh, or about the same load you would do if you were in person? I'm doing about the same load as if I was in person, but I think I'm taking more units this semester. So they're heavier coursework, but the same number of classes. Awesome. Well, thanks for being with us today and Sharon, I love your t-shirt. Thank you. That's my, that's my mantra, live life, give life. Um, I want to ask uh, Melissa now a question about, uh, Melissa, can you share with me what was your main goal for establishing uh, transplant families as a resource? And uh, has that, how has that shifted in 2020? Hi, Chris. Thanks for having me. <clears throat> well, <laughs> our main focus was to bring transplant families together. This process, as you know, can be very isolating and it can make you afraid. Um, I wanted to have um, other families to have the benefit that I had, and I know many others have had, of having that individual like um, parent, fellow transplant parent that helped guide you along the way. Um, my background being in IT, I decided to launch a website <laughs> when I was going through this whole process with my son. And um, he, of course, was born with cardiomyopathy and um, he needed a heart transplant. He was listed at six months. We had to travel for care, which was even more isolating. Um, and he got his gift at eight months old. We went through all this with, um, I had two toddlers in tow. So the whole family comes on a journey when you're on a transplant, as you know. <laughs> and, uh, but we made it through um, with family and um, all of our extended family at the hospital because we consider them part of the family too um, also. We, um, we started this because we wanted to create a place where people could come and find research and connect with families and can connect with all of these different community groups such as your foundation um, to see that there is hope. Um, it looks very frightening at first when you're going through the process and you're seeing your child die in front of your eyes. Um, you need that support and to see that they're going to get through this, get through the transplant. And when they do, when they get that gift, when you get that call, everything changes. And uh, then they need that support afterwards immediately. When you go through some of those bumps, you have some feeding issues, you have some school issues, you have some back and forth in the hospital. Um, you know, but once that happens um, and you have that support there, um, it means everything in the world. Um, so we were lucky enough to definitely make um, transplant families grow into a nonprofit. We collaborate with um, a lot of different organizations such as yours, uh, some quality improvement organizations uh, with physician and nurses and groups like Action, Starzl, IROC, um, and they've helped us along the way make that parent voice count. And uh, I think we all know how much the parent and patient voice means in this process. Um, we've been able to make some real change um, with them. As far as 2020 goes, um, we were able to recently collaborate and give our voice um, along with the Pediatrics and Infectious Disease Society to make um, some documentation for families that are going um, back to school. As you know, this is a super frightening time. Um, you know, having social distancing and mask wearing, that's kind of our everyday normal as a transplant family. But having guidance um, with these collaborative groups and groups like UNOS is even better. It helps us be able to just give that to other parents to know, like, this is what we can tell our school to expect. This is how we can educate um, the greater community in order to help us be safe as well. I know in this process, I miss my friends. You know, I've been able to recreate in the mountains and We've, uh, you know, there, there have been some real silver linings, some good quality time with our family and some great socially distanced camping trips and some other things, but I miss my friends. You know, we're, we're all pretty social and especially when you're preparing for a transplant or going through the transplant process or, or working hard to bounce back from that. Um, I know having my support network made all the difference in the world for me. And uh, it's a little more challenging to connect people right now in person. So uh, thanks for all you're doing to help support transplant families as uh, we all go through this uh, transplant process together. 
Thank you. My son's also an athlete. He looks up to you. Um, he runs cross country, wrestles, and he loves, he trains every day. So he misses his friends as well. And especially getting, he still trains even though he's on his own. But yeah, it's been a gift and, you know, to have family close and to have that time and to have a different kind of connection for sure. Yeah. Good for you. Thank you. And good luck to your son with his athletics. That's awesome. Glad he's Thank doing you so well. much, Chris. Yes. Dr. Bach, I want to come back to you um, and ask you, how can parents and caregivers of pediatric patients be the best advocates for their child? Yeah, I think um, what Melissa was just saying sort of leads in really nicely with this because, you know, like she was saying, she was um, worrying about her baby who needed a heart transplant and then her entire family came in tow. And, and I feel like... Um, the first thing is like, it really does take a village. Like, I know that's just a saying, but it really does take a village to um, help take care of and make somebody with a new organ in their body thrive. So I think that's part one. Um, and with that, I think one of the biggest things that I wanna say, it is an isolating experience for families, especially when you don't know anybody else who's going through it. So you know, please like ask for help and we are there to be with you and to hold your hand. And as much as, you know, the entire community can do it together in terms of families interacting with families, but you know, this is not something that we as a medical team or anyone is asking you to do alone. Like we expect to be part of this and to be very much part of this for, you know, especially the beginning parts and then through the entire part of your child's life. And with that being said, I think advocating for your kid, you know, we might know you well, but you know yourself and you know your kid better than anybody else does, hands down. So if something in your gut is not quite right, you know, please like tell your physicians, your nurses, your coordinators. I always tell families, you're not going to hurt our feelings. I promise you, you're not. You just like tell us if something isn't working. Like, and you know, we have come, I have families, you know, who advocate for their kids and they come up with like the coolest options of things that we as physicians or nurses or respiratory therapist just wouldn't think of because, you know, although I take care of kids with kidney transplants, I don't have one in my own body and I don't have a kid with one at home. So, you know, we have these, we have families who are like, let me show you how I best secure my dialysis catheter device. And like, you know, let me show you my new mask that I'm wearing that will work much better. And so I, I think, you know, we learn so much from you guys. So, I think my biggest advice can be, you know, speak up, you know what you're talking about. Like this is your body, your kid's body, and it's a big deal. And you know it better than anybody else does. So just speak up. And like I said, you're not going to hurt our feelings because we're here to like support and make people be well. Um, and the goal is the same, I think for all of us, right? That you have like an awesome life and you can run track and, you know, you know, be on your snowboard and do whatever you need to do. Indeed. I certainly had uh, some great support when I was going through my transplant. My friends would come over and play chess with me and go golfing so I didn't crack while I was on the waiting list. And then, of course, uh, the post-transplant post uh, care and, and understanding the responsibilities of uh, adhering to my new uh, anti-rejection drug protocol and, and listening to my body and everything. It took a little adjustment. And thankfully, I had you know, my family and friends and a great transplant team and coordinators behind me that helped me get through that. So thank you. Yeah. Um, I want to uh, go back to Jean. Jean, you've been a uh, mother caregiver, advocate, and now donor. What can you tell patients and caregivers who are currently on the waiting list? You know, I think, um, one of the most important things to remember um, when you're on the wait list and you know your your family or your child is sick and you're waiting, um, it's it's very easy to think that this is going to be your new normal. And I think it's you know if you look at I always say you know you look at life as a timeline. These moments are just so small on that timeline, and it's important to remember that you know on the other side is 
really going back to life and living life again. You're a great example of that, Chris, with all the stuff that you've done. Lauren has gone back to doing all those things that she did before. So, you know, I would just say keep the keep positive and focus on the fact that these this time of being on the wait list and going through this transplant surgery part is only a small moment in time. And and there's better uh, life on the other side of that. And I would also recommend, you know, reaching out to organizations that have people that have gone through the experience. Um, you know, that's one of the best things that came out of the first time when Lauren had her uh, heart, uh, you know, was waiting on the wait list for her heart, was we met actual uh, young people that had had transplants that were on the other side and were doing playing tennis and skiing and doing all those great things. And you know, Chris, we do that uh, those trips down to Mount Sinai and we meet, we go to NYU, we meet transplant patients, that gives people hope. So, you know, welcome those people in and listen to those stories because there's a, a you know, transplantation is a beautiful thing, so. Every time we're in New York, you and Lauren show up and, yeah. uh, and help us advocate for organ donation. And uh, you and I and, and Lauren have visited so many transplant patients that are going through that sliver in time as you described and thinking that this is their new paradigm their new norm and asking themselves wow is this really the quality of life that i envisioned mm -hmm. and uh, it's important for uh, all of us to that have gone through the process and had a, a great outcome uh, to go share our stories with them and say hey listen you're going to get through this and and uh, ultimately you can live a very healthy, active quality of life. And I think that's, uh, that's really important. I remember after my transplant having to take a handful of pills shortly thereafter. And I remember saying to my mom and, and my wife, like, I never took a Tylenol regularly or a multivitamin <laughs> regularly. And now I'm taking a handful of pills. I'm never going to get used to this. And now I take a multivitamin and one, one uh, milligram of Prograf every morning. And that's about it. So. That's it. It does, uh, it does change, and uh, sometimes we just have to dig our heels in and persevere through those tough times, as you said. Absolutely. Good advice. Thanks, Jean. You're welcome. Nancy, uh, back to you. How has your experience influenced who you are today and, and how you live your life today? Well, I would definitely say it's made me more aware of organ donation, and there I, then thereafter I can educate other people about organ donation as well. So I have a really amazing platform on Instagram where I share about not only my medical experience, but also about organ donation and your guys' foundation. And it's really amazing. And then um, I think also having a liver transplant set me up for all the other medical stuff that I've gone through since then. Um, and then also it's provided me a support system through like different avenues like um, support groups, but also I've been given the experience of going to a serious fun camp called the Painted Turtle, um, and it's in San Diego or Lake Hughes, California. But they they have multiple camps throughout um, the the world, and it's it, they cater to different illnesses, different chronic illnesses. Um, but I go to the Liver Transplant Week, or I did when I was in in the age group. And I got to meet so many other people who were my age that also had liver transplants and it made me feel less alone. And it was really just, I've had amazing experiences in this community, I guess, meeting other people who share this, this journey that's really unique, really, really unique, but it's also really beautiful. Do you get asked often by classmates or, or friends or uh, as you meet uh, new people about your transplant and, and are you okay? Uh, um, do, do you look forward to answering that? I always look forward to answering it. Um, my dad was my donor. So oh. it's like even even more like special to share because I get to say like, yeah, I have, I have an autoimmune disease that caused me to need a new liver, but also I got my liver from my dad and he's still here. And it's also sharing, like educating other people that not all liver transplants come from deceased donors. Like you can get a, don a donation from a living donor or a relative. Like it's, it's really cool. That's awesome. 
Well, like uh, Gene and, and Melissa and, and Dr. Bach, you always show up when we're in San Diego and, and help us spread the uh, positive message of organ donation awareness. So I love thank, to do it. Oh, you're awesome, Azzy. Thank you. Well, Melissa, I want to uh, ask you, uh, what's a common thread you see between transplant families? Well, we all watch and fight with our children while they go through organ failure. We all hope for something better, and we put our faith in the amazing doctors, nurses, and support in place for our kids. We all breathe that collective sigh of relief when we get the call. <laughs> and then our kids are on the same steroids, immune suppressants, and round-the-clock medication protocol. Every transplanted patient has something valuable, some piece of advice to give to one another. Our kids are on the same appointment schedules. Eventually, they transition from sick kid to just everyday normal kid. And through all of this, we never forget how precious every moment is. Every day is truly a gift, and it's thanks to our donors. Mm -hmm. Indeed, it, uh, it gives you a different perspective, doesn't it? It certainly does. I remember that when I was racing again after my transplant and thinking, you know, racing in this competition head to head with another athlete next to me is pretty easy after what I went through. And I think that was a huge part of me winning my medal. Uh, maybe I wasn't the best rider out there that day, but I had this perspective that I've been through a heck of a lot worse. And I realized what a new perspective of how scary my transplant was and, and how, um, how that whole process really strengthened me as a person and gave me a new perspective that when I was racing, it was icing on the cake. And I was so lucky to be out there doing that. And I think that's uh, a big part of, uh, as I said, it sounds cliche, but shaped me into who I am and, and let me know what was truly important in life. And uh, I try to, you know, start my day every single day with affirmations and gratitudes. And we've got a lot to be grateful for, especially as uh, transplant uh, recipients and, and transplant families. At the time, it's terrifying, but that perspective is a blessing that you just can't replace. Mm -hmm. No doubt about it. Thanks, Melissa. You're awesome. Thank you. Um, Laura, do we have uh, some questions? I've asked uh, a few questions and I can continue, but if we have uh, some questions from any of our attendees or uh, if you, you or, or CC want to ask some, please uh, feel free to let's open it up and uh, engage anyone that's uh, joined us if they have some better questions than what I asked or build on uh, some of the things <laughs> that we've already been discussing or you also can go in a different direction. Um, Virginia submitted a question and it's a little long, so bear with me, but um, I think it's a good one. It's for Dr. Bach. Dr. Bach seemed to indicate that she has observed that transplant recipients who are on Tecrolmius <laughs> have a lower immune response to COVID-19, thus avoiding a full-blown illness that we would have seen in others who are not on immunosuppressants. Did I understand her correctly? Does Dr. Bach mean this is the is the case only in children or does that apply to adults too? I'm asking because my son is a liver transplant recipient who has taken a leave of absence from work. He's anxious and to get back to work and this statement by Dr. Bach might inspire him some more confidence in being able to go back to work safely. So that's a good question. Um, you know, whether I think you're quite, I'm reading your question here so I can answer it as properly as I can. Um, you know, no, you know, it's, um, I think it's something that we suspect, you know, we don't know for sure. Um, you know, I think initially when sort of COVID hit, we, we really, worried that people who are immunosuppressed would be in the very, very high risk group. Um, and we haven't seen it as much as we had assumed it might happen um, when COVID sort of came about. Um, so I think, you know, in terms of your son who's an adult, I think it's a conversation he should have with his primary liver transplant team. And I think a lot of it matters as well where you're living and sort of what is going on with COVID in the place where you're living. You know, if you have extreme extremely low rates of COVID and everyone is wearing face masks and everyone is trying to be distant and everyone is, um, you know, doing all the things that are recommend that are recommended, you're in a different place than if, you know, um, 
where there are much higher COVID rates, um, positivity rates, and maybe mask wearing isn't quite as prevalent as in a different place. So and I, it does matter, I think, too, what your son does for a living. You know, um, there are obviously higher risk jobs and lower risk jobs. Um, to the point of um, one of the panelists before, you know, I think a lot of people were initially scared to come to hospitals during COVID, but I agree. I think this is one of the safest places to be because you can't even walk in through the front door without getting your blood, your um, temperature checked and you know you have to wear a mask and we all have to be distant all the time. So if that is something that would be happening in your son's um, workplace, I think you know he should definitely check in with his primary transplant team and see what their recommendations are in terms of him returning to work. Dr. Bach, I uh, reached out to my transplant coordinator. I'd read an e-blast from another transplant program that had suggested that immunosuppression may uh, actually, I don't want to say help avoid or lessen the severity or possibility of getting the ARDS and the cytokine storm. And like you said earlier so eloquently, the really the, the worst side effects of this uh, COVID pandemic or, or, or getting that. And uh, I asked her and she said, yeah, we've had some transplant recipients uh, at University Hospital get it and do really well. I mean, not even really know they had it. And we've had some that have gotten it and not done so well. So I don't know if uh, there's any conclusions there yet, but it seems like uh, what you shared, it may not be as bad as, as we initially thought in terms of being immunosuppressed, may not be as disadvantageous as we originally thought. Is that fair to say? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I think the more we know about this now, we know the higher risk groups are um, people who are um, either very overweight um, or have diabetes um, or have um, sort of the comorbidities that go with that, like hypertension, things along those lines. I think, you know, it depends very much on who you are as well as a transplant recipient. You know, if you're an athletic um, young person or not young person, but athletic and healthy otherwise, you do fall in a dis different risk group than somebody who might um, have other risk factors like the diabetes or being very overweight, things along those lines. And I've we've observed the same thing. And, you know, what we see also from sort of the the transplant groups around the world who are sharing their experience. I, I, you know, the tough thing is you always wish there were lower numbers, but we won't know more until there are more numbers. But, you know, in our transplant program, fingers crossed, you know, um, for in pediatrics, we've only had since March had one kid test positive. And the only reason we knew she tested positive was because she was having a procedure done and was COVID tested. So, huh. I mean, I saw her in clinic three days earlier. She looked as healthy as could be, and I would never have known she had COVID. Um, but I think you said it exactly correctly, Chris, you know, we have some folks who you don't even know they have it, and then some people who also are immunosuppressed and have organ transplants who get pretty sick. So I, I think the gamut runs, you know, the spectrum is pretty wide, but it is, I think a lot of us are suspecting that having a low dose of immunosuppression on board might stave off that like super extreme response of the lung inflammation and being, you know, prone and ventilated and intubated for a very, very long period of time. Good. Well, let's hope that's the case. And let's talk about just for a second, while I have you, about being active post-transplant. You know, clearly I push the uh, the boundaries a little bit or, or the bar and as an Olympic athlete, you have a very short window in your career to really be at the top of your game and to compete at the highest level possible. And so I was extremely aggressive post-transplant and, and getting back and the Olympics only come every four years and it was on home turf six hours from my house in Aspen, Colorado, I wasn't going to miss it. So I was uh, pretty aggressive in my return. But what are your thoughts? I mean, so often healthier, more active people are doing better with COVID. And we know that healthy, active transplant recipients that listen to their bodies and don't overdo it, but I guess exercise sensibly uh, seem to do much better. What, what do you prescribe? post-transplant for your patients 
in living a healthy, active lifestyle, not overdoing it, and finding that balance of listening to your body? Yeah, so I, that's an excellent question. I think, you know, a lot of folks when they hear, oh boy, I need a new organ, you know, they they worry appropriately and say, oh my gosh, am I going to have to live in a bubble, you know, stay away from people and oh dear, like, can my kid go to school? Can I do all the sorts of normal things? But I think the point was made both by you, Chris, and one of the other panelists, you know, the reason we do this is so you can go back to being the person you want to be um, and the person you hope to be as well. So, I mean, the point of having an organ transplant is leaving your life as fully and happily as you can. We know, and I can speak more in the world of kidney transplant, but we know that people with who were either on dialysis or who need a kidney transplant or have a kidney transplant, they have hard, higher risks of cardiovascular disease as they grow older in age than the general population compared to their age does. So I think your point is an excellent one. You know, um, engaging in exercising and um, eating a healthy diet and doing all those sorts of things are huge parts of sort of being a whole and happy and healthy person after transplant. However that, whatever form that takes for you, you know, we have families that say, oh my gosh, I'm so worried. Can my kid be a gymnast or can my kid be a wrestler or can my kid be a chess player? Like, yes, the answer is yes to all of those. You know, you always take risks in life and you have to sort of weigh those risk benefits. But, you know, the benefits of the cardiovascular outcomes greatly outweigh the risks of your hurting your transplanted organ. Um, and, you know, the goal here is for you to live a long, 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 long time. So you need a healthy heart to do that. Um, so I think we all feel pretty strongly in sort of the transplant community, like, you know, go do all the things and lead the healthy life that you can for all the benefits, not just the cardiovascular and the physical ones, but I think also, especially, you know, right now where everybody's so isolated, the mental benefits and the um, sort of all of those things as well. Awesome. Thanks, Doc. Good mm -hmm. advice. I certainly uh, subscribe to that. Lauren, um, do we have some more uh, questions from the chat? We do, and can I ask that all the panelists turn on their webcam so then the audience kind of rem remembers who we all have here, but I do have a question ah, for, everybody. yeah, exactly. Um, I, I have a question for Melissa. Um, hello, it's Aaron. Hello, I donated my kidney to my eight-year-old son last year at Seattle Children's Hospital. He's doing amazing and has so much energy. We are also, he is also an avid, or we are also an avid snowboard family. Erin had to fit that in. But she was asking, um, what's the name of Melissa's website? So Melissa, I wanted to give the opportunity to you to tell them the website, maybe what, how they can get involved with your organization. Certainly, I'd be happy to. And thank you so much, Erin. I'm glad to hear your son's doing so well. Um, our, our website is Transplant Families, um, and it, families with F-A-M-I-L-I-E-S dot org. And you can find a slew of um, information and resources there, including all of the 504 documents you can bring to your school uh, regarding COVID that we've partnered on so many other great organizations with. Love it, Erin, that you're a shredder too. <laughs> um, Mazzy, I have a question for you from Valerie. Where, what are some of the challenges that you have faced socially, emotionally, physically, just growing up post-transplant and or with a chronic illness? Um, I think the main thing is just having doctor's appointments um, throughout school, um, missing a lot of school because of those. And then also maybe like not being able to go to someone's house after school or go for a sleepover with someone else because of having to adhere to a medication schedule or that type of situation. And there have been times when it was difficult, but overall, um, all my friends have been very understanding of the situation. I've been very open about my health to everyone in, I mean, not, not only in my close circle, but I'm just open with my med medical history in general, just because I enjoy educating other people and having other people understand the experience and how I'm different than you, but we're not that different. So if you can't make um, adjustments for me, then I need to find other people who will make adjustments for me because I am worth your time. I couldn't agree more. 
Um, we have our first hand raised from Jason. So Jason, I, oh, somebody just moved and now I can't find your name, but Jason, I'm trying to unmute you so you can ask your question. Are you unmuted? Um, okay, I will go to Doug. Doug also raised his hand. Um, Doug, are you there? Hi, yes, uh, Doug Hausman. I, I really just don't have a question. I'm just, um, uh, I know Gene personally and um, um, a president of organization here in New York, Hearts for Us. And uh, I'm just completely inspired by these stories and how articulate and uh, amazing all of you are in terms of, uh, of advocating um, for organ donation. And um, I'm trying to come up with a question, but you, you've really, you know, <laughs> covered the whole gamut. And it's, it's really just an amazing um, testament, but you know, I, I just have to give a shout out to uh, to Jean because I know her and Lauren so well, and uh, just so amazing the um, the the gift that Lauren has given us in New York and all that she's done, and, and as well as you, Jean, and then and then for you to make this incredibly selfless gift to uh, to save your daughter, it's just it's an amazing thing. So really, just um, really just kudos for this uh, for this wonderful forum. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, Doug. Um, I was just scanning really quick to see if we have any more hands raised, but I do have a question from Steve, and this one's for Melissa and Jean. Um, I think we're circling back to how did you get through the challenges of transplant? Jean, did you want to go first, or did you want me to? <laughs> All right. Um, with a lot of support from community. Um, it was starting with all of the clinicians in the hospital, our doctors, our nurses, they were our first line of support. And our second line of support was our family. Um, we had a lot of family that couldn't handle it and that happens quite often. Um, you just lean on the ones that can and are there for you. Um, and the resources. There are a ton of resources out there. Um, we got to know our social worker real well and uh, they helped us with um, all of the things because it's so crazy um you know out of control watching your child go through this um it's emotionally draining uh, it's financially draining um everything is kind of it's not what any one normal person can handle on their own so definitely lean on the supports there for you uh the psychologist in the hospital they're the help parents too um everyone um definitely that would be my advice jean Jean, are you unmuted? Okay, I was waiting for the organizer to unmute me. <laughs> um, so yeah, I would definitely echo everything Melissa said in terms of you know your the support, the people are around you are so important in the process to get you through. Um, you know, I was really fortunate, you know, to have great family support. Um, even just recently with my kidney. Uh, you know, donation, my sister-in-law, you know, with COVID, you can only have one by the bedside. And so, um, you know, we had to arrange so that the day, the, the morning of the surgery, I went downstairs and we kind of did a handoff so that she could go back upstairs and be bedside with Lauren. And so, you know, I, I, I love her for that. You know, she, that gave me peace of mind and enabled me to go through that surgery and not have to worry that, you know, Lauren had someone there with her. Um, but I also think too, in, in addition, you know, because Lauren was a little older when her surgeries happened, I, you know, I think it was really important to keep that level of positivity high in the, in the, in the hospital room and never, I could never let her see me sweat. I could never let her see me cry. I had to be strong and I think that, you know, that's such an important part. We did, you know, we, we kind of created fun things to do. We had really great support through um, the hospital with Child Life, um, but like, you know, the little things like Lauren created a wall of fame for all the, the doctors and nurses that came in and she had a little Polaroid camera and she printed out pictures and put them on the wall and, you know, people would come in and say, how can I get on the wall? But, you know, little things like that, making that in-hospital experience 
um, you know, to try to brighten it however you can, I think while you're going through that process is, is really also super helpful. And it's not easy. <laughs> Lauren, do you want to take another uh, question or two? And then I want to give everybody a chance to uh, share kind of a, a final few comments in closing. Yeah, we have not had any more questions come through. So if we want to go to that and I'll I'll uh, raise my hand or inter interrupt if, if there's something that pops up. Okay, perfect. Well, I'd love to, first of all, I wanna say thanks again to all of you for taking time out of your day to join us and, and help others. We're uh, recording this and we'll share it through all of our Chris Kluge Foundation uh, social media platforms. And uh, again, the, the real reason d'etre for our uh, foundation is to help other people and uh, share our experience and uh, our uh, support with those going through the same thing that all of us have. So thank you guys for making this a great conversation today and, and for being a part of it. Uh, I'd like to give each of you a chance just to share any final comments you had that uh, we may have missed or something that you want to uh, restate that you think is very important today that can help others, uh, especially with what's going on in the world. So Maisie, if you want to start, go for it. Ultimately, ultimately, I would just like to say that a support system is the most important thing in this process. Um, finding a good, like as a recipient, a good group of friends who will support you in the process, but then also as um, a, a family or a parent, just to have the people around you to support you during this time as well. It's so important to have people around you. Indeed. Melissa, do you want to share anything? I'd like to echo what Matt, Mazzy said and just say, yes, definitely that support system and taking time for yourself. As parents, we forget to do that sometimes. So um, take a deep breath and make yourself, you know, at one, just give yourself some time and then you can give that to your child as well. Is that one of the, the real silver linings of COVID too, isn't it? That we've had a chance to take a deep breath. I found myself sitting here in my office and I couldn't find something uh, in the early days of COVID. And I said, well, we've been in our house now for four years and I've wanted to organize that drawer. And I just took the darn drawer and dumped it upside down. And I took the next one, and I dumped that one upside down. And I said, you know, is there a better time to clean out my drawers and get some of these projects done? And that's a poor example, but you know, I guess it's uh, allowed us to hit the reset button and catch our breath and, and again, prioritize what's important to each of us in our lives. And well, I miss my friends and, uh, and you know, being, being able to be as social as we all like to be, um, it's given me a chance to connect better with my wife and my kids. And hopefully all of you and, and everyone that's joining us have had the same opportunities. Agreed to see what's truly important. Yeah. And it'll make uh, those relationships that much stronger and uh, those re-engagements, uh, if that's what we call it, that much more special. For certain. Gene, any uh, closing comments? Oh, we got to uh, turn her mic on again. Sorry about that. Um, okay. I would just, again, say, you know, just staying positive, um and uh you know living life afterwards going back to living life and um encourage people to sh share their story because it is you know in doing that you really are helping other people get through the process and chris you know shout out to you um for all that you've done and you've been such a great friend to lauren and to so many people um i've got a, a chance to experience that live going up to aspen so thank you so much you bet. Attitude hi, is hi. everything, isn't it? Can you say hi? <laughs> Attitude is uh, is everything. And I remember when I was when I was racing on that day in uh, in Park City in the in the ninety eight in the two thousand two Olympics, and I said, you know, I don't know how I'm going to get on the podium today, but there's no alternative. And uh, I remember that with my transplant too, lying on the recovery floor at Seven West, saying, I don't quite know how I'm going to make it back, but that's what I'm doing. And the power of, of visualization in, in life, not just in athletics. And 
you got to see it to make it happen has been uh, so powerful in my life. And, uh, you know, again, just setting your mind to something, you can accomplish anything, even when you're in the worst of the transplant waiting list process or recovery and, and wondering, am I ever going to make it back to being on my snowboard or back to school or back to work or, or whatever it is that you've set your mind to and is your goal, the uh, the mind and, and visualizing where you want to be and, and believing it and seeing it to make it happen. Boy, have I ever experienced that in my life in a very powerful way, both mm -hmm. in athletics and transplantation. Dr. Bach, you got some uh, closing thoughts or, or ideas or advice for us to send us on our way? Um, yeah, I'm so um, inspired by all of you. You guys are all such lovely human beings. Um, I'm so happy to have met you this way. Um, you know, I think everybody has said this a little bit already. I feel like when you're waiting for a new organ and all the things around it, like the days are really long. Um, and but I promise you and you know like I'm just the bystander here and I just see what happens afterward but those years are short like awesome stuff happens afterward and you just like take off and soar and that's where we want you to go yeah there's a bump here or there but you know what that's why we're around um and we want like your wings to be clipped and out you know like that's kind of the goal so I think um you know, hang on when you have a minute when you're thinking, oh my God, is this going to end? It is, and it's gonna get better. So I think, um, you know, um, both to Jean and Melissa and to Mazzy, like being able to tell other families what you've been through is so valuable because there's no way that we can say it, you know, from the medical provider side, because like I said, we're just the bystanders here. Well, thanks doc, thanks for all you do. and. Thanks to uh, all of you for joining us today. And uh, this is the first of our four conversations that we're going to have culminating at our, uh, our Summit for Life event, our virtual Summit for Life event uh, this year in Aspen in early December. Um, so Lauren, if you want to uh, take it away and you can uh, share a little bit about that and, and help us wrap this up. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, Summit for Life, is always the first weekend of December, um, but we are extending it because because of COVID, we are going virtual. So not you don't have to travel to Aspen. <laughs> you get to do it from your home, your treadmill, your staircase. Um, we're about to launch the website here next week. So please, um, we'd love for you to join us uh, with Summit for Life. It's typically a night nighttime uphill race up Aspen Mountain. So you don't have to come to Aspen, but we'd love to invite you next year. <laughs> um, thank you to everyone that's joined us today. If you've thought of questions that we that you wanted answered, we ask that you submit them in the comment section in the survey that you'll receive after the webinar ends. We want to equip you with all of all that we can during this time of COVID and wherever you might be on your transplant journey. But we can only do that if you let us know how we can help. So. The recording of today's webinar will be available at chrisklugfoundation.org and our new COVID-19 transplant resource site. We hope you have a great day. Stay safe, stay healthy, and remember to wash your hands. <laughs> Thanks, everybody.